there, my name is Ken Mayer. I'm going to be your instructor for this course. I want to talk a little bit about my history and experience with a lot of different routing and switching companies. It's uh, really kind of been over two decades, uh, plus, you know, before this whole world of Cisco came along, I was doing some other things in the high-tech industry. But I've had the opportunity to uh, watch and grow with companies like Cisco, other companies, competitors that I won't mention here as well, which has caused me to be able to have this skill uh, that I need to be able to work with either an enterprise, whether it's small, medium, or large. And also in the last oh, probably 10 years, I've uh, had the opportunity to work with a lot of internet service providers, cellular phone providers, and uh, to be able to fortunately travel around the world to be able to uh, facilitate not only training, but also uh, in the world of consulting. So when it comes to Cisco, of course, uh, I work with uh, routing and switching. I do work with security, voice over IP, service provider routing uh, as well, and um, probably some other things that I can't even remember. And I do many of those things with uh, other organizations. Now, one of the things that's really great is that a lot of the different types of protocols that we're going to talk about are a lot of open standards, which means that once you understand those uh, quite thoroughly, you can work with almost any provider. It's just a matter of learning the command line. So let's hope that I can do both of that for you during this course, is that you'll be familiar, comfortable with the command lines, and that you have a good understanding of the protocols and the uh, processes, so you understand what it is that you're looking for. And uh, that's kind of my goal, is to make sure that you are going to be better at not only working with Cisco's equipment, but again, having a better understanding of uh, why we implement some of the different uh, types of configurations that we do. Now, in this module, we're going to talk about network design. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of uh, look at the theory, some hierarchical models, some ideas that help you not just, you know, put a bunch of switches into the closet, wire everything together and call it good. We want to talk about the reasons why we make different choices and uh, how those choices can help you in improving network communications to be able to help you with uh, the scalability or future growth. And we're going to take a look at some of the uh, operations that switches go through in how they can uh, forward packets or frames based on whether or not we're going to be using IP addresses to make decisions or whether we're going to be using MAC addresses. So yes, our conversation is going to be centric to Ethernet networks. We're not going to talk about any other type of uh, layer 2 encapsulation model. So that's our focus and that's what we're going to uh, discuss and show you, give you some demonstrations about uh, some of the command lines that we use to be able to, if anything, just verify that switching is working the way we intended it to. So we're going to introduce and uh, discuss this whole thing called the uh, Cisco hierarchical model. It's a model that's been around for a while, although over time it has, you know, changed a bit to address other issues, some of which like security, but I'll talk about that. But when we uh, look at the hierarchical model, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss uh, the problems that we have with the, what we call a flat network. Now, a flat network just simply means that all of your endpoints, the uh, printers, your um, wireless access points, your laptops, your BYOD, the bring your own devices, computers, desktop servers, they're all on the same uh, subnet, basically, what we would normally call the same broadcast domain. And the problem that we have is that, I mean, you can certainly add more to it, but as you add more and more devices into this flat network, you'll see that you really don't have the scalability you want because of this thing called a broadcast storm. And uh, I'll try to diagram that and make sure we all understand that. And then that's where we're going to move to the Cisco hierarchical network, where we'll talk about things like the access layer, the distribution layer, and the core layer, so that you have a good understanding about the benefits that we have. Even if you don't think future growth is in the future, Boy, does that sound uh, somewhat redundant. Anyway, let's hope that it is. For your company, for your organization, we always want to be able to think about growth. But we also want to think about application support. Uh, if you decide one day to start to converge your traffic and move from just data to voice over IP or maybe to video, you know we're going to see some big problems when it comes to a flat network. And we're going to see how we can address those with the uh, Cisco hierarchical network. So I'm going to build a flat network first, and whenever you see me put these little squares in, because I'm not going to uh, take the time to put the little arrows in between each one, that's going to be uh, representing a switch. In this case, a layer 2 switch. Uh, by layer 2, I mean it's going to make all of its forwarding decisions based on uh, an Ethernet MAC address, the thing we call that burned-in address. And uh, let me make some connections between these, make sure we have some redundancies so we can cause loops without spanning tree. 
And uh, you can imagine w with uh, all of these switches, whether you want to think that I'm drawing multiple floors or, you know, just where they are in the rack, whatever. Uh, the case here is, is that each one of these, I mean, at the low end, right, we have switches that are going to be 24 ports, maybe 48 ports. Uh, and again, I'm talking about the low end of the uh, product line. And if you think about all these uh, endpoints that are connected to it, they are at least not sharing the bandwidth. These aren't hubs, so they all get their own, you know, uh, gigabit uh, Ethernet speed. Maybe it's 10 gigs uh, between the switches. You know, we're trying to uh, accommodate for uh, aggregation. But once any one of these computers connected here sends a broadcast, that broadcast, by rule, is going to be flooded to every switch in the network, which means all these uplinks that you have are going to be uh, uh, basically uh, used up on their bandwidth from each of the broadcast traffic that is sent. And, uh, and you start multiplying that number of broadcasts uh, being flooded uh, amongst all of the different computers and all of the different computers or endpoints that are going to start or initiate these broadcasts. What we end up with here is having what we call a broadcast storm. Now, a broadcast storm just simply means that once a broadcast is sent, everybody within this area is going to be hearing that broadcast, whether it was meant for them or not. And so it, not only is it uh, using these what we would call trunk links between the uh, switches, but it's also going to be uh, eating up um, connectivity and communications for all the other endpoints. Now, technically, um, it's not just broadcast traffic that is going to be sent all over the place. Uh, we uh, have to flood what's called bum traffic, where the B stands for broadcast traffic, the one I just mentioned. But there's another type of traffic that switches have to flood. It's called the unknown unicast. That's when uh, the uh, destination MAC address doesn't exist in the switch's uh, CAM table. So it has to send a flood out to uh, try to help find that um, destination machine. And then, of course, there's multicast. So that's the BUM. I just like calling it bum traffic. It sounds fun. All right, so maybe in your network design, and this, by the way, it would be the example of a flat network design uh, because we're all on the same broadcast domain. So when we look at this, you might say, well, right now it's controllable. Maybe, uh, the, you know, you've decided through your own network analysis that uh, this bum traffic isn't causing you that much of a problem. But then I have to ask the question, what happens if you need to expand your network, that you need to expand and add more uh, ports for the uh, computers, the endpoints to connect into. What's going to happen when we add that other switch? How much more broadcast traffic are we going to acquire? In other words, it's very difficult to grow your network when you have a flat network. So then comes the hierarchical design. And in the hierarchical design, I had mentioned three layers. I'm going to talk about each one in a little bit more detail as we go. But one of the ideas was, and this is how we originally looked at things, is that you know, when we had this um, uh, flood or this broadcast storm coming in, one of the implementations we started using was uh, some sort of layer three device. So if I could replace this thing at the top with, let's say, a router, a router would create different broadcast domains. In other words, routers were not allowed to propagate a broadcast from one segment to another. Uh, everything going through the router, with the exception of multicast, of course, um, had to be uh, a unicast address so that we uh, could control that uh, propagation. But then we would have to redesign these connections that we have, um, you know, like take away this little connection here, you know, so that we're not uh, uh, circumventing the router by any means. We also used VLANs to uh, help control broadcast traffic. Uh, but if you think about it, uh, a VLAN where I might choose, uh, let me again get rid of some of these other little lines. Let's connect these two. Um, it, when we had uh, VLANs, it was pretty much the same as having a router. What I mean by that is that we might have created a smaller broadcast domain, and maybe there's another VLAN here for another broadcast domain, but we still had to have a layer three device to be able to get from one VLAN to the other. In other words, it was no longer flat once you started implementing those types of solutions. And, uh, and those solutions are very important because it also facilitated the uh, eventual growth of your network. So when we start looking then uh, at the uh, hierarchical model, and like I said, I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this, we're going to talk about having what we call the access layer. And uh, at the access layer, uh, depending on how you put it together, not all the switches are connected to each other in the access layer. But the access layer gets its name 
because that is the first point of access for most endpoint devices. So that means that in this access layer that I'll put down here, that I can have my printers, my laptops, my smart uh, phones or uh, other smart devices, all making their first point of entry uh, into this network. Let's see how good my uh, Visio of a printer is there. And, uh, and, and so if the traffic was local, all things were good. Uh, they could talk to each other off those local switches that they are all connected to. But the idea was, whether I use VLANs or not, was to limit that broadcast traffic. I didn't want the broadcast traffic to still to flood. And so often what we would do is we would move, and uh, we often call these a distribution switch. Some people might call them a um, multi-layer switch. Multi-layer, right? That means that they can make forwarding decisions at layer two, MAC addresses, and they can make um, uh, decisions on forwarding at layer three with IP addresses. I'm uh, creating what we call an ether channel, which uh, is later on in our course uh, between those. And so we would send our traffic up here instead of trying to connect them down at the bottom. Whether we use VLANs or not, that, uh, you know, is, is another design issue. Um, but uh, the idea here now is that to get from, uh, let's say, one part of the access layer to another part of the access layer, we would go through the distribution layer and then be able to avoid having those large broadcast domains. And it would be easier to start adding new switches for the access layer because all I would have to do by adding a new switch is just make sure that it can get to the distribution layer. Uh, would we still use VLANs? Absolutely. VLANs not only created broadcast domains, but they also uh, helped us with a lot of, uh, of security types of problems. Now, in some cases, in our distribution layer, uh, especially if we had long distances or different uh, buildings in our campus, and we might not connect uh, these distribution layers together, we would also have this other layer called the core layer. The core layer would have, of course, a higher performing multi-layer switch. Uh, it could use a router, but I'll, uh, I'll give you that example here in just a second. But the idea now is that the core layer was designed to move traffic uh, at a very high speed. Why would I use uh, another multi-layer switch, a more powerful one than uh, a router? It just kind of depends because outside of the core layer, if I have to leave to go into the, let's say, the world of the internet, then, uh, and in doing so, I'm going through a service provider. If I'm not leaving through uh, what we call Metro Ethernet and maybe taking some other WAN type of technology, a router does good at translating from Ethernet to that other layer two encapsulation to get you out to the World Wide Web. And so that's where I might generally see a router because uh, we're actually translating from Ethernet to some other type of uh, interface or communications. So those are the three layers of the um, hierarchical design. And as I said, I'll talk about each one uh, a little more detail as we uh, go into uh, all of those. But I hope what you're seeing here is the ability for your network to grow and to be able to what we call scaling out without uh, really flooding the whole world with that bum traffic. We want to be able to uh, uh, control it, give us better service. And you know, there's just so many other really cool things we can do here. It's very important for us. But uh, that is what they call a hierarchical design. All right, so let's uh, talk about each of those in a little bit more detail. So let's look at that access layer. That access layer, as I said, we're generally talking about switches. But that's not the only way into the access layer to have a switch. You might also have a wireless access point. Those, by the way, are antennas on the side. And that access point generally is going to a switch in the access layer. All right, so let's talk about that access layer. As I said, it's the entry point uh, of any endpoint device. By endpoint, what I mean is that the traffic going to that device is not going to be relayed. I mean, a switch, that's a transit type of device. Traffic coming in, we're expecting it to be forwarded to some other location eventually to get to another endpoint. So that's what I mean by the endpoints. So we could, uh, again, like I said, we could have uh, computers hooked up. We could have printers hooked up. You know, in today's day and age, we might have telephones, right? The voice over IP phones hooked into our uh, access layer. Uh, let's, uh, let's put a wireless person over here, right? Making that connection to the access point. So 
what we see at this access layer, and remember that's going off eventually into the distribution layer, what we see here is that uh, we might have a convergence of different types of traffic. As I just got through saying, I could have voice over IP, voice uh, traffic, regular data traffic, uh, maybe some sort of video, if that lo hopefully looks like a camera on a tripod. Uh, it could be a video voice over IP phone, but it's a variety of different types of traffic. So that's where we start seeing the convergence. Now, from the time that uh, Cisco first started talking about this hierarchical model, they didn't uh, mention this as another option, which is introducing security at this layer. It used to be it was just the distribution layer where we talked about security. But as we know, uh, in today's world, we need to have security you know, at every layer we can. Uh, we talk about when hackers are trying to uh, break into the network. And remember, I'm talking about the OSI model when I talk about layers. So at layer two, that was the uh, data link layer. And that is a type of encapsulation, a way of uh, encoding um, uh, your data into uh, the way it's going to be transmitted as a bunch of ones and zeros. And then above that was the IP at layer three, uh, called the network layer. And yes, I know if you're uh, in a sw this switch course, uh, you're more than familiar with uh, all of these layers. But the reason I'm taking the time to talk about it here is that in the uh, earlier days, we didn't really see security introduced at this layer. And the idea was is that a hacker could break in and take your network over at layer two. That means they generally owned all of the uh, layers that were above it. And so, you know, when it comes to security, this becomes a new place to introduce that security. So I got to be careful I don't turn this into a security class. Um, anyway, one of the very common types of security that we're seeing now is this port-based authentication, 802.1x. Now, remember, this is an IEEE specification. And everything that starts with 802.1 is uh, really the uh, category for switching. I don't want you to confuse this with 802.11, which is all about this uh, wireless access point here. But uh, we can use um, 802.1x there as well. Anyway, um, port-based uh, security just meant that if uh, somebody walked into your office and decided to plug their laptop into your network that, uh, and hoping that your DHCP server would give them the um, IP address and gateway information, that they could start moving through your network. And 802.1x basically says, no, you have to authenticate. You have to be able to provide me with a username, password combination. You or the machine that you plugged in, either one of them, has to be able to authenticate and prove that you have the uh, access privileges to get there. And in some cases, uh, we can even now create security lists with what we call the VLAN access control list. And that's pretty cool uh, because we can control traffic per VLAN if we wanted to. And later on, uh, you're going to hear us talk about private VLANs, which uh, can add another uh, layer of uh, security. But so that's kind of, like I said, new within well, I say new because uh, I've uh, been working with Cisco pretty much since the company was uh, uh, founded in some way or another, and uh, that was never a discussion uh, that we would have before. And also the, at the access layer, obviously, we support multicast. I mean, if you think about it, if I'm going to send out a video stream, uh, that video stream is starting at the uh, access layer. And with multicast, very important that we uh, don't treat it like a broadcast. You know, if there's only a few uh, um, computers that are in the access layer that want the multicast stream, it'd be nice if our switches can also help uh, make sure that that's the case. So that's what multicast is all about. So coming from the access layer that I just described is all of this traffic from uh, multiple switches. And as I said, we uh, probably would be using what we call a uh, multi-layer switch. Okay, so a multi-layer switch by its design is actually uh, much faster than a lot of your routers. Remember I said the uh, purpose I might choose uh, routers for is to uh, do some uh, layer two translation, going from ethernet to uh, whatever else you might be using in the old days technology like HDLC, PPP, oh, hopefully never frame relay again. But anyway, uh, it acts as a uh, traffic aggregation. We do kind of hope that at the access layer, we can keep as much traffic local as we can. But you see, there was this old, you know, in, in the old days, we had what they called the 80-20 rule at the access layer, that 80% uh, of the traffic stayed local 
and 20% had to be routed or forwarded to some other location. But with today's uh, cloud services, private or public cloud, uh, with the uh, advent of server farms, um, with um, going to the internet, that's changed. Now most everything is the 2080 rule, which is 20% of your traffic stays local, 80% is going out, maybe even more. So that's why we say the first thing that they have there is traffic aggregation, because what we have is a lot of streams of uh, data coming in to a central point. You know, maybe we have other distribution components, which would be great, so they can connect to uh, other access layers, and that's where we'll eventually get to the uh, core layer. And so uh, our decisions here are usually what we uh, called routing. The reason I call it forwarding is uh, when we get into kind of the model and how it's all put together, you get kind of a better picture of why I like the idea of layer three forwarding. Routing is simply meant looking at the IP address, assuming that you're using an IP network, uh, and then making a routing decision about the outbound interface. But all this traffic is coming in, but being aggregated from all these other uh, parts of your uh, access layer. So here in the uh, distribution layer, I'm just going to type D-I-S-T so I don't have to spell the whole word, uh, is where we aggregate it, we make the routing decisions, and the idea is, is that uh, you know our traffic can come in uh, one interface from one part of the access layer. After we look up the IP address, then it can go out to whatever the destination part of that traffic is, what's local and that part of the uh, access layer. Another part of our design is redundancy. Because if I did connect it the way you see here, uh, we could have a problem with uh, one of those uh, multi-layer switches going down. Or, and from now on, I'm going to try to call it a distribution switch instead of a multi-layer switch. So what we might see then is in our design at the access layer is having perhaps redundant connections as you see here. So I always have a different uh, method or way to get out. Or as we move on to some other topics later in our course, uh, we'll talk about some of these things I call the first hop redundancy protocol, which is another uh, set of uh, protocols when we get to that try to get rid of that single point of failure. In any event, what we're trying to do here is uh, um, have the redundancy in the design so that, as I said, we don't lose uh, you know, big chunks of our network. But where I told you what was new with the access layer, where we started at, uh, adding in this um, idea of security, this is where security, we used to tell people, was the first place that security was introduced. In fact, it was about the only place that we tried to introduce security. And that's because at layer three, we could create an access control list and to be able to utilize that access control list as a packet filter firewall. For that matter, we might have even had firewalls in there uh, that uh, were stateful and did a little bit more for us. But it was still a way of controlling the traffic to uh, make sure maybe uh, the traffic from our end users might not have access to the uh, part of uh, maybe human resources networks. And so we could control that uh, through the distribution layer. Of course, I also told you we're adding phones. And by the way, if you don't recognize this uh, symbol, there was a day that uh, phones had this little handset you picked up and a little dial so you could dial the numbers. Uh, and that's about the best phone I know how to draw. So that's what those little things are. The little curve is the handset. But uh, one of the things we have a problem with is I said, hey, we do traffic aggregation. That means there might be a competition for the services of the distribution layer to forward packets because it's dealing with a lot of packets. And so we also introduced QoS, quality of service, so we could give preference to traffic who's uh, uh, really, if it had latency, latency meaning it takes a while for the packets to move, could really damage that service. In a phone call, we just hate having things sound like they're uh, breaking up. We don't like to uh, miss packets or drop packets. We don't want to uh, make it sound like somebody's talking through a blender. So we uh, also introduced uh, QoS in there as well. Uh, and, of course, we could also filter other types of services, um, you know, from a, a lot of the uh, uh, needs of, um, of, you know, somebody else trying to do a service that uh, probably isn't uh, part of what we asked for. So, um, and, and that filtering, I'd probably put more with the firewalls uh, there at the distribution layer. But that's what we're looking at. Then, of course, uh, depending on your design, uh, as I said, if what I just drew, let's say, was uh, building A on your campus, uh, and I need to get to building B, uh, then I would probably go through, as I said, the core layer. And the core layer, as you're about to see, is uh, got a different uh, designation, a different type of uh, 
of what it's trying to accomplish for us. So at the core layer, and I know you're probably getting tired of seeing me write access, hopefully spell it right, distribution. And as I just got through saying, I might need to get from uh, building A over here to building B. I mean, this is one example. This could all be in the same building. It's just um, I'm trying to conceptually give you an idea of what's happening here. And so what happens is we'll send our traffic from one part of our network or campus building into the core. And we're still going to be using uh, a uh, multi-layer switch. We'll call it a core switch. And here, all we're really worried about is high speed. When I say high speed, that generally means that we're not involved in uh, enforcing security policies at the core layer. If you think about it, when you start adding your devices to inspect every packet to make sure it's approved, you're going to be slowing down that throughput of traffic. Security services does that, and it should do that uh, because it's you know very a lot more complex. Uh, it's not just looking at a routing table and saying, oh, that's where it goes. It, there's more to it. It takes a little more processing power. So we want the core to be high speed. And if you think about it, you had to uh, pass a security check at the distribution layer to even be able to get your traffic up to the core layer. And so it's built for high speed. But again, it could be an aggregation port uh, for all of that traffic coming from the distribution or the different distribution layers. And we also should have redundancy just like we did at the distribution layer to avoid a single uh, point of failure. Now there's a lot of different things we can do to do what's called fast conversion. Fast convergence just simply means if uh, one of my connections goes down and I still want to be able to forward my traffic, I have to find the next best route to get there. And, uh, and depending on some of the things we'll talk about when we get into the uh, routing protocols, we'll see uh, what we can do to uh, do that fast convergence. That means I don't want to wait 40 seconds, uh, which might happen with some routing protocols, for you to find the next best route because 40 seconds is going to uh, end a phone call. It's going to break sessions. It's just not good. I want to get this. If I could, I'd love to get my convergence to less than one second, if that's at all possible. So at worst, I might miss a packet or two. And of course, by adding a core layer, I can move on to maybe a building C and have even that future growth availability. So the core layer is all about speed, and that's kind of our uh, goal in this hierarchical model.